So amazing. It's so great to see so many people and more people coming in, tuning in from different parts of the world. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm Fedia. I'm the community lead at GIG, the Global Innovation Gathering. Um, very happy to be starting this as the first community talk of this year. Um, I would like, first of all, to welcome our speakers uh, who are here and who are going to be introducing themselves. Um, and I just want to give a quick background on why we're here today. Just a second, I need to fix. Yeah, so amazing. So today we're going to be talking um, on business models for makerspaces, generating income for makerspaces. That is such an important and very big topic, especially with a lot of makerspaces that are based in countries with more challenging circumstances. Um, this has started, first of all, as a, just a casual conversation that I've had with Omar in Karu. and was just so impressed by how Sanatec managed to make it uh, despite all the economic political challenges uh, that Egypt has been through in the past 10 years. And then Amr was just giving out all this information generously. And I thought, wow, that would be very interesting for our members. And I thought maybe even more members would like to share how they make it happen. Um, and then we had the amazing Anna joining in uh, as a member and um, an old time member and also part of the MAKE um, team who thought, oh, this is exactly what I've been working on for the past 10 years. I'll be happy to put in more ideas and to connect more people that are interested. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm just happy to welcome everybody, everyone today and maybe hand over to Anna, who's going to be starting the series. This series is meant to happen um, for on the the period of the next six months is going to be 10 episodes where each episode we tackle a different aspect about business models and generating income. So welcome and passing it on to Anna. Thank you so much, Fadia, for the intro and welcome, everybody. Um, I just want to echo Fadia and say I'm really excited to see so many people here from so many different places. Um, and I think that's really a testament to how important this topic is. Um, and also, I'm happy about the fact that we've managed to bring several different strands together of, of interest in this, um, so that we're having a, a bigger conversation than it would have been separately. And I think that's really important to be able to exchange ideas. So um, the uh, the MAKE project that, that Fadia mentioned um, is... Um, I'll put the uh, web address in the chat in just a moment, um, but it's... Um, an EU-funded project looking at the how we can strengthen the maker ESA's ecosystems in Africa and the EU. And um, this project has given me the opportunity to do some work that I've wanted to do for a really long time, which is to really dive into the um, economic models behind um, maker spaces and small-scale manufacturing. It's a topic that's dear to my heart because I've been involved in setting up um, various different maker spaces in um, the UK. Uh, Ghana, Jordan, um, and some other places. Um, and I have felt the struggle as a, as a founder, as a co-founder um, of how you um, keep the place open to meet your social goals while at the same time as being able to pay the rent and the staff. Um, it's difficult. Um, so one of the outputs from the MAKE project is going to be what we're turning an open catalogue of business models. This will be um, openly licensed and shared online um, for everybody to, um, to to read and to contribute to in the future. Um, so we're going to be doing a series of interviews um, to gather information for that. But we also thought it'd be really helpful to have some public conversations. Um, and um, together with, with the gig community, we're, we're able to, to start that now. Um, we, as Fadia mentioned, this is intended to be the first in a series of webinars. Um, so we're very much using today as a prototype in good maker fashion and um, we're testing um, a certain format and an approach and we would love to have feedback at the end of it on what you'd like to have more of and less of and also what topics you think would be important to cover in future ones. So um, today's focus, um, 
to have seen is going to be on consultancy as one of the elements of a, of a business model. And we've um, picked three um, wonderful speakers who have got different experiences to share of, of that. Um, and just to start off with um, a bit of a clarification or a definition. So we're, we're using consultancy to mean basically anything where you're you're getting money for the time and the expertise of the makerspace staff. Um, and they usually do have expertise in it. So it's normally not um, for doing an experiment or something like that. That's more likely to be core funding that you get. Um, and typically in, the, in a consultancy, there is some element of either an output or um, contributing to to something which is a goal of the client um, so it's not just a project that you've wanted to do as a makerspace and you've managed to get some funding to deliver that um, but the you know there isn't always a, um, a clear line between um, these things and, and others may have different opinions so the format we're going to go with today and try is we've got these three expert speakers. We've asked them to give us a five to seven minute um, introduction each about um, their work in consultancy. And um, after that, um, I'll start off asking a couple of questions and then we'll open up to have questions um, from everybody and discussion. And I'd like to make clear that when it comes to the discussion part, um, we're also interested to hear examples and, and um past experience from all of you participants as well. It's not just asking questions of the speakers, it's everybody sharing their, their knowledge. Um, please feel free to put questions in the chat at any time. Um, and uh, if speakers particularly want to answer them as they go along, they can, but otherwise we'll come to those um, at the appropriate time. So with that, I'd like to hand over to Omar and Safdi from Samatek in Egypt. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be among all these wonderful people. And thanks to uh, Fedia, Anna, and all the team who made this come to, to light. <laughs> and I'm really humbled to be uh, on the first episode of, of, of uh, this uh, series. Um, I have some slides to share. Um, I will give you like uh, a quick brief about uh, Sanatic and what we're doing uh, that can be considered as uh, consultation uh, or consultancy services. Um, let me just share. Down. So, um, so you can see the screen right now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, we we are Sanatic. Um, Sana. Um, means craft or doing something by hand in Arabic. And actually the the story began in, in, in 2011 after the revolution. And actually we started, we kicked off the, 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 what we call like the technical innovation ecosystem in Egypt with FabLab Egypt at first. And actually Sanatik came to life in 2016 after we somehow figured out for the first or five years after we established Fablet Egypt, how to uh, generate revenues from, from solid revenue streams. And we started to figure out that we can have like a solid business model to what we all do. Uh, so Sanatic basically uh, has a vision, which is democratizing the technical innovation and building a community of uh, impact filmmakers. And I always use like this picture because it really represents what um, a community should look like from our perspective. It gathers all people from all, you know, genders, backgrounds, and and whatever. So, um, just a quick uh, numbers uh, or fun facts about Sanatic. So, um, Sanatic now at the moment it serves around twenty five k beneficiaries every year. And we have a network of seven nodes. We call them nodes. It's 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 maker spaces and and fab labs mainly. We have a network of seven uh, across the country. Uh, and actually, we 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 um, we were part of supporting more than thirty maker spaces and fab labs around Egypt and the region. And 
we have uh, a network of programmed alumni that exceeds 2.5k uh, alumni. Um, actually, this is how Sanatic products look like. So we have mainly two products. Uh, each of them ha has its own services and sub services. And we have like this basket of programs, initiatives that goes beyond or, or goes um, um, rooted from, 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 from the collection of these services and sub services. And to give you like um, 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 a visual image of what Sanatic provides and how we generate revenues for, for, for the company and for our services, this is the metrics that shows all of the services that Sanatic provides. And I categorize them in B2B, B2C, and both. So if you can see um, on the screen, for example, we have the, the makerspace access and the community building activities, which are mainly uh, targeting the end users, the individuals, and we, um, we provide them through our different products and services through Sana Academy and, and Fab Lab Egypt. Uh, we have other services like the labs in installation, support programs, and capacity building programs, which we will talk deeply uh, about some of them in the next slides. But those are the B2B services. And we have things like engineering services, educational programs, and events that can be uh, targeting uh, businesses and institutions and also uh, individuals. So, what do we do as consultation? Um, so from our perspective, um, we have like two main services. We call them cash cows because they are now somehow solid and they generate regular revenues in either monthly or yearly, but they are solid and we, we are mastering it somehow. So, um, it's, it's, it's going smoothly. One of these services is the engineering services. Um, and actually the engineering services is um, utilizing our resources. Resources can be the team or can be uh, the, um, the network that the makerspace have as part of their alumni, community members, volunteers, and so on. So we utilize these resources to provide technical and engineering services for clients. Uh, these services might include 3D printing, metalworking, woodworking, electronics production, embedded programming, product development, and so on. But the main idea of the engineering services is you, is you have a client and they want to build like a project or solution and they don't know where to start from uh, or they're looking for someone who can provide the whole solution. They, 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 they don't want to to go for a, a, a software house to build their code and go to an impact, a manufacturer to build the metal enclosure. They want to go for only some entity to build the whole solution. Um, and actually we had like some success stories in, in, in this service uh, and, you know, to give you an example of the interests and the client categories we deal with, we deal with hardware startups, business owners, um, uh, business owners who um, who build decorations, uh, toys for kids, and they use the machines and they use the design services to 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 develop these products. We work with artists. We work with the industrial sector. We work with medical field and research, and we work also with cinema and media. And actually, the list goes on. Um, Actually, you can see like these photos for enclosures, big sculptures or, or big uh, objects of 3D printing. Um, actually, this project, the, the Pass App project, it's, it's a hardware startup in Egypt. And now they're working with the government. They, they, they are selling uh, access control solutions and they are in the batch production phase. So we help them uh, building all their units uh, in, in at, at the Fab Lab premise or the facility of the Fab Lab. This is a list of some of the clients we work with. And 
proudly the team um, finished more than 300 projects in the last five years. Um, and as a case study or, or, or a business case to, to give you like um, uh, a visual image of how things uh, go when, when a client approaches us. Actually, this project was requested by Orange, the telecommunication company. Uh, and actually, this project is interesting because it tackles one of the fields that are not aware of the digital fabrication technologies in Egypt, which is the media and the movie industry. So the, 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 agency, the, the agency that works for Orange, they had like an idea for a TV ad and they wanted to uh, have, you see, you see the last picture, they wanted to, to, to turn a celebrity, a uh, celebrity known in Egypt, he, he's an actor, he's a, a comedian, actor uh, they wanted to turn his face into something that can be um, uh, used as a fountain so actually the mouth like it water comes from it and they wanted to have like this sculpture as part of the uh, creative uh, work and the creative art in 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 the ad so in normal cases they do sculpting, manual sculpting. And actually this takes like a lot of time and it's not that accurate. And if you want to hire like a high level artist, you will be paying a lot and a lot of money. Uh, so we, we, we consulted them and we advised them to use 3D scanning and 3D printing. And we started to put a team together to, to work on this project. So you can see the 3D scanning part. And we had like an artist to do the refining and modeling. And we did the 3D printing actually in FabLab Egypt and in with other partners that have 3D printing services. And actually we had another artist to do the post processing. So actually number four is the 3D printed part, but after refining and post processing. And then this is a, a snapshot from, from the ad itself that was aired on, on the TV during last Ramadan in 2022. Um, another example for the services that can be considered as, as, as consultation services. And actually this is one of the biggest cash cows for us, the lab installation. Actually, this is this is really booming in Egypt and and the region because uh, the government and the private sector is 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 giving attention to 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 the innovation spaces at the moment, and um, they they want to hire like an agency or they want to hire some experts to do the installation itself to have their own innovation labs. If it whether it's it's a fab lab or a VR lab or electronics lab, IoT labs and so on. So building on the experience we had for the, the 10 years, we started to position ourselves as the go-to uh, platform for, for this. So we started um, offering our services, uh, advising, layout, procurement, installation, training and management. But we enclose all of these services and we start the services itself by doing like a free consultation session for the stakeholder or for 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 the 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 organization or the institution uh, uh that they have the plan to to establish this fab lab and from this point we take them like step by step to uh decide which services they are interested into uh more Actually, we have a huge portfolio on, on this. Um, we work now with government, schools, universities, corporate and international organizations. Um, we install all kinds of labs. Mostly, most of them are, are considered fab labs and maker spaces, but we also receive requests for um, IoT labs, electronics labs, and VR labs. Uh, during the last... 10 years, actually this photo is not updated, but we established more than 30 maker spaces. Uh, and this was a number by the end of 2022. And actually we started to expand regionally. So we're now trying to offer our services, not only inside Egypt, but outside Egypt. Uh, and um, as, as I mentioned before, we work with all types of organizations. Uh, last but not least, we have also 
some other services that can be considered as consultation, but to, you know, because um, I, I think I, I talk too much, but I can give you like a, a brief examples about all of these um, bullet points. So we do consultation in capacity building and support programs. So we have clients who wants to uh, develop a capacity building program that has like a maker ed part or digital fabrication part in the program. So for example, we have incubation programs and incubators that come to us and they want us to, to help them develop a program for them. So we're not the providers of the program, but we help them develop the program itself to include uh, uh, part about maker education or digital fabrication or uh, the mix between entrepreneurship and 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 product design and so on um, actually for events we started also to capitalize on the 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 experience we have because we've been provide we, we've been organizing different events like maker fair Cairo and organize the fab conference once so we started also to offer our services to be part of bigger events so Actually, while we're speaking, we 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 we're working now with Coca Cola, for example, to um, Im implement or to um, uh, add a section about sustainability and make an innovation in their food festivals that they do all over the year. Um, and as I mentioned before, the list goes on. I think and I believe that. Uh, consultation um, can be standalone services or also it can be like add-on service uh, to the services you already provide or actually uh, a gate to to uh, to use to onboard the clients and from this point you can upsell or cross-sell other services that your makerspace have um i think that's it and sorry for taking this long <laughs> thank you that was super interesting thank you so much omar um so let's just move straight on now to morris please um this is morris kashinko from kamasi hive in ghana good um afternoon evening morning everyone wherever you're watching or you're tuning from the world. Um, my name is Maurice. Um, I'll try my possible best to do this in the shortest possible time, uh, since we have a few questions and uh, from the audience as well. So Kumasa Hive is a tech and innovation space. Uh, we are also best known for uh, Makerspace, um, running the first Makerspace in Ghana. And Anna was very instrumental to setting up our Makerspace back in 2016. So th thank you, Anna, for that. Um, and I think we've grown since then. Um, so we are more or less like a business startup as a makerspace um, from the NESD, and we now run fully as a makerspace. Um, we have various services that we focus on. So hardware, of course, is a makerspace. So fabrication labs, hardware is a key focus, innovation um, as well. Uh, we're looking at um, a few of our services that has bring us some level of um, importance. And for that reason, being able to do the consulting work, which has brought us to this particular conversation, um, which is uh, we also do some level of business consultation when it comes to makerspaces as well, how to you know, create business models for makerspaces. So we, as an organization, have now helped about three different um, other hubs in the country to set up makerspaces, um, a few others outside of Ghana as well. Uh, we also were very instrumental to setting up the Africa Makerspace Network. I'm pretty sure a few of you are part of it. Uh, we've had opportunity to work with Make as a project as well. Um, so basically, um, these are the things that we do. So laser cutting, 3D printing, filament extruding, CNC milling machine, desktop table saw, engraving machines, soldering and uh, soldering station, welding machine. Um, I think anything that really works in the fabrication lab, basically, that's what we focus on. And we have worked with quite a number of partners in the past. So Crowd Africa Strategic, um, SIA, GIZ, MEC, quite a number of people to be able to set up the makerspace we run currently in the country. Um, as part of 
our our goal in terms of consulting, we are currently running a project with um, the Cosmos Innovation Center and the Mastercard Foundation to set up five maker spaces in the five major universities in Ghana to support agricultural production. So we are setting up right from the north of the country to the south. So five main public universities in the country, we have gotten some level of financial support to set up maker spaces. And that is one of the huge ways of generating revenue. We also offer, like I mentioned, the services to artisans. And I don't know if you are aware, but where we are situated in Ghana is actually known to be the, um, the artisan hub of the nation. Uh, we have a very popular place called Swami Magazine where you have every artisan you can think of from woodworking to metalworking, whoever it is that is within the artisan space is, is mainly based in, in Kumasi, in Ashanti region. So uh, with our um, sophisticated equipment and tools, we are able to provide services to the local market to then generate some level of revenue. And because of how we've um, helped situate ourselves in the ecosystem, it is then very easy to then deal with um, stakeholders that are interested in production. One of the things we 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 um, we like to think of ourselves is that um, uh, we are poised and positioned to industrialize Africa. So, however possible we can do that to make that work, we do that. And we've had some level of partnerships, like I said, with a few um, international um, organizations and even local governments to be able to set up these things. And so, for that reason, we would like to think of ourselves as consultants in the nation and on the continent as well. So. Um, I think in the I think that's it for now. So we can take the questions as we go on. I don't want to take too much time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Morris. Very interesting indeed. And for our third speaker, um, we have asked wow. Vicky Wenselman yeah, um, to tell us a bit about her work. Now she is focused on being a consultant rather than being a makerspace and a consultant. So we thought this would be an interesting perspective to bring in. Vicky, over to you. Thank you so much. And I have paper prepared a few slides as well, just so that I keep it to a limit. And I very much relate to something that Anna said earlier about um, sometimes you need to use consulting because your organization doesn't pay the bills yet. So that's what happened with me. Um, I'm Vicky. I have this saying in my life that detours make better maps. So you understand your situation better if you've taken a few detours. I've given you three pictures of me here. The first one with the mushroom is my favorite. That's uh, during the occupation of an ancient forest uh, to provide uh, coal mining under it or where it is uh, in my home country, Germany, and um, firm believer in mushrooms. Um, we can learn a lot from them because they survive under very interesting circumstances. There's a great book by Donna Haraway on it, digressing. The one where I make this face is on a panel and I'm looking at the innovation lead of the World Food Program, um, talking about how they use blockchain. And um, if you want to make that face, just Google that project. And the other one is me making a very grown up consultant face and it's a bit um, Saad says I look constipated in that one. Um, and that is also how I sometimes feel when I have to talk about this consulting stuff. Um, because consultants tend to sometimes take themselves very seriously. And it's um, very much this, I work for McKinsey. I have a very high day rate and here's my expertise. Everybody listen to me. Um, I don't really believe that anybody has that much experience. Um, yeah, I'm a systemic organizational consultant. I sometimes also do research and topic-wise it's innovation ecosystems and in particular mobile maker spaces that I'm interested in. Um, this is not a full list. This is just to give you an idea of all the detours and Bear in mind, I'm German, born in 1980. Um, I am privileged AF, so um, I had the incredible opportunity to study for a long time, study cultural anthropology and African studies, um, have a ton of jobs next to my studies because studying is free in Germany, so it doesn't cost you money to take long 
Um, so you can work a lot in the meantime, do internships, even if they're not paid, do a lot of these things. And um, the point that I wanted to make with this is it's a very, very diverse set of things and very few of them uh, looked as if they would pay anything, but every single one of them made a lot of sense to me. Like um, we did something called Global Innovation Lounge. That was basically Geraldine saying, um, hey, Republica, the internet doesn't stop at the borders of Europe. So why does the lineup of your speakers? Um, and so she invited a lot of people from all over the world and um, created a program at Republica called Global Innovation Lounge. And that led slowly but surely to the development of GIG. And we founded it officially, I think, in January 2017, we filed the paperwork. And um, yeah, it, it started paying people properly in 2018, if I'm correct. Um, and yeah, I kept doing random things, a thing called doing development differently, where we had a very limited budget, but support from the Canadian embassy in Berlin. And um, 80 people showed up and talked about how can we do this development cooperation differently. And there were a lot of little things happening, making was coming up, hubs were already there, but not as many. Um, I had no idea that there was such a thing as open science, um, but all of these things, some at some point, I found them very interesting and um, was earning money as an agile coach working for e-commerce startups and grown-ups in Berlin and as a systemic organizational consultant. So that is the people that do the strategy consultings and process consultings and all of that. Um, again, mostly for German companies that could afford this. Um, I had brilliant mentors. I did a lot of, um, like I always saved, saved some of my income and invested a lot of my income in the beginning into learning more, doing, getting more of these stupid certificate, but most of all learning more skills and broadening um, my scope of, of knowledge and um, make my toolbox bigger in things that I found interesting, very often not really sure it was a good idea, but just thinking, hey, will one day pay off? Um, the thing I'm most proud of um, is, is mobile makerspaces. They were never a thing um, and we made them a thing. So um, a lot of people have had mobile makerspaces. There were boats, there were trucks, there were suitcases, there were a lot of different things. But um, similar to co-working spaces and hubs, it needed some pushing and some, some storytelling and some really nice projects. And so I drove my own truck from South Africa to Uganda in 2019, right up until COVID hit. And then it was always the plan to um, <clears throat> take it to South Sudan to give it to my friend Jexana from Platform Africa. That didn't work because I had to leave Uganda at some point, but I left the truck and many moons later, um, the truck now is with Platform Africa in Uganda in a refugee camp and they're using it as a mobile podcasting studio, uh, mobile media literacy studio and how that relates to consulting is A, one way to earn money as a consultant is to write proposals and um, be smart and put yourself in it. Um, as a further consultant on the projects, I did not do that, of course, in the Labmobile project, but um, I did it in the Toloka project, which, um, which is mobile makerspaces for Ukraine. And, um, that basically started with a very short email from a colleague or somebody I'd worked with before in within GIZ, the German Development Corporation Service, who texted me early in March last year saying, we want to send mobile makerspaces to, to Ukraine. Do you have any ideas? And an hour later, we were on the phone and... Um, I didn't really stop working in this project up until now, and I'm incredibly proud of it. And um, 
this did not exist. Like there was no funding for mobile makerspaces. Um, nobody has ever sent a fleet of mobile makerspaces anywhere. And being able to have done this is probably the thing I'm most proud of in my life. Um, don't know if that says good things or bad things about the rest of my life. Um, we still don't know how how much sense it will make afterwards. Like you can only evaluate these things later, but what I'm trying to say is this is how it looked like a big fat holiday, but I learned so much on this trip um, through Africa and it's now all being put into action in Ukraine. Um, and why do I do this? I firmly believe that this sentence is true. Rather than worry about critical mass, our work is to foster critical connections. And we're all lucky to live in times where this is something that people understand that have money, like organizations, governments, businesses, um, organizations and development corporation, they understand this innovation ecosystem was not a term anybody knew or used um, 10 years ago. Now it is. Um, and at the same time, we have all created this and that means that we create the future as we go. And um, this is about emergence. And so Anna asked me to share a little bit about how I, approach these things as a consultant because what Omar said about um, we con our consultancies is either building up labs or helping with design, consulting on design and production. Um, all of this is here. This is an expertise on what you do, like you're experts on what to do. Um, the lab building is also part of process consulting, how to do this. Um, and this is basically just a mental map that I use for me. Um, if a business is in normal state, they don't really need that much consulting. If they are in a state where they need content consulting and process consulting, we call that a doctor model. And the consultants basically take over. Again, I hear that this is McKinsey's favorite model. Um, I think a lot of you should be expert consulting in um, the sphere of makerspaces. I should not. Um, if the world depends on it, I can calibrate and use a 3D printer, but I should rather not. But I know how to set these up, what is lacking, especially I know how to um, facilitate the, the processes that lead us to creating spaces in which people can shine, in which makerspaces are regarded as the incredible third spaces that they are as the um, support organizations for startups and for change and for innovation that they are. Um, but I should not, I'm not a maker per se. I'm a Susie homemaker and I like playing around, but I'm not the person you call when you need a design. And so tip here, if you think about going into consulting is where you like position yourself on that mental map, because that defines which clients you should consult on what and be successful with it. And then again, right, where do you want to be? Um, do you want to be an expert? Do you want to be a process consultant? Um, do you want to be one of those doctors that basically takes over? Um, and if you know that, then what do you need to get from where you are to where you want to be? And then how do you learn that? And another map that I find very helpful always is what are your competencies? Like look really honestly in a mirror, maybe um, sit with a friend or have hire a consultant again, um, a coach, because you as a consultant are made up of personal competencies, social competencies, your field competencies, and your methodological competencies. Ah, that's a tricky one. I'm not an expert maker. I have a lot of field competence in maker spaces. I guess that's pretty obvious, but it's a bit tricky to wrap your head around what that means. Um, 
and yeah, and then the last thing is the theory of change. And that's kind of like, you know, with all the different poo 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 things that I've done, I've always known what change I want to see in the world, basically. And I don't know, big five for life or whatever you want to call it, your 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 why, your golden circle. Um doesn't matter. I call it theory of change and I adjust this like once or twice a year. Um, I always wonder which jobs do I like, which consulting gigs do I really want to have? Um, Cause they fit in there and um, theory of change, like a lot of little bits change about it, but the general things stay the same. And um, here are some books that I would recommend. Um, if you are interested in becoming an um, organizational consultant. And this is very much how my head looks and what I'm working on. So strategy, Kanban, holacracy, um, continuous improvement, all these things. Um, and what you also need is the elevator pitch. So hi, I'm Vicky. I'm a systemic organizational consultant working in the field of digital development corporation with a regional focus on sub-Saharan Africa and a topical focus on innovation ecosystems. And boom, and it took me a day to write that down. So I hope it goes a lot faster for all of you. And um, thank you. Looking forward to the uh, questions now. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, um, Vicky, and also to Omar and Maurice. Um, that's been very interesting indeed. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is a prototype um, in terms of format, and I'm um, concerned about the amount of time that we had allocated for this whole um, event being an hour, and I really want to make sure that we have some um, discussion time. So. What I think we're going to do is we're going to take, I'm not going to ask my questions. I'd like to go straight into some of the audience questions. Um, we're going to take 10 minutes to discuss those. Just before the hour, we will stop and do a couple of um, sort of wrap up messages that um, need we need to get through. And then people who um, need to leave on the hour, which was the scheduled time, can do so. And then anybody who's interested um, and would like to stay a little bit longer with no expectation that the speakers do, but um, obviously are welcome to as well if they want to, um, people can consider the continue the um, discussion a little bit past the hour. So um, I I've seen a couple of um, questions come up in the chat already. Um, uh, there was a question, um, a clarification question for Morris from Andrew um, on, on how you make money from working with universities. Yeah. Could maybe take that one first, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, so yeah, I didn't get into details because of time it was an introduction. Um, so I was hoping to have the question time so we can talk. Um, but to your question, um, basically, we make money from the investors in two ways. Um, so we, one, consulted for a development partner, in this case, MasterCard Foundation, um, to and the government of Ghana, the agricultural ministry specifically, who wants to focus on local production for the agri sector. And um, what, we were, what we then did was that all we're, we're doing currently is that we have identified talents in the universities uh, to then be able to create um, jobs by creating innovation. So we have um, the government together with the MasterCard Foundation give us money to be able to run this project and build the maker labs. So that's one aspect of it. And for the, the sustainability of it, we have trained our own people to be doing a um, regular trainer of trainers um, for the universities every quarter with which we are paid to be able to carry out this TOT. And, and we are looking at also all the businesses that are coming out of the maker spaces on the universities being incubated at our space, which we call the Agri Center. So we have um, an Agri Center, which is focused on agricultural maker space and innovation as a maker space, right? So we have the Agri Center. So all the businesses that will come out of the universities are to be incubated at our space. 
And we're also going to have equity in those businesses for being able to support those businesses to come to fruition. So that's one of one aspect. So actually it's three ways. So yes, the, the funding from the government and MasterCard to build the maker spaces. The second one is the uh, training of trainers that we're going to do quarterly for the, the staff of the university to run the spaces. And number three, we're looking at um, the incubation of the startups that are coming out of the maker spaces and having equity from them. Uh, but what we usually do is that, of course, the, uh, the money that comes in to build the maker space then stands, stands as an investment to then be able to build our own maker space to continue of, of offering auxiliary services to the local community to be able to then pay for the human resources that are in the maker spaces, right? So it's an investment in both ways. So we take money from the universities to build their maker spaces invest in the quality of our own admin center, the makers which we're, built, uh, we're, we're updating, we're upgrading, to them continue to provide auxiliary services to the communities that we operate in, have the businesses from the maker spaces incubate with us, and then have equity in those businesses as they, 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 they leave our space. I don't know if that answers your question. Again, I'm mindful of time so that other speakers can also talk about it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maurice. And yes, I think Andrew's written in the chat that, that that did answer his question. Thank you. Um, Martin, if I could come to you next. I know you had a question if you want to unmute and, and ask that yourself. All right, thank you. Um, I think the question which I asked in the group here is just if um, Vicky is also giving, um, uh, if, if Vicky is, is also, uh, giving support in terms of um, of uh, consultancy, mentorship, that is. I do sometimes, not not right now, but um, just ping me and um, I'm happy to, to see if I can help or if I know someone who's, who's better suited. Very happy to. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question in chat from, um, is it Shashank Dewan? I apologize if I haven't um, pronounced that right, but would you like to come off mute and, and ask your question? I think this is a question for Omar. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, my question is for Omar and the uh, uh, advertisement work you did was really interesting. Uh, like uh, it was like combination of all the things we are doing currently. But uh, my question is, uh, the, how did the company know that you could do those kind of work? Like, is there any uh, ex, uh, like social media platform you uh, expose your uh, work to or how did they know about your work? And yeah, that's my question because uh, in our case, uh, the visibility is quite low and most of the people don't know about our maker space, uh, FabLab Nepal. So that would be my question. Okay, great. Thank you for the question. Actually, for, for, for this case specifically, we got approached by the uh, agency that was responsible for the TV ad, and they knew about the makerspace or the Fab Lab services from one of the artists who did some work with us. So actually they reached him to do the sculpting typical work and they and actually he redirected uh, them to 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 us. Um, so answering your question, so in general, we what we do to to have this publicity and to offer our services and 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 make this appealing to to uh, corporations and, and the industrial sector and so on um we have a very active social media uh and we try to um uh, to showcase what we're doing as a business case or case studies so even if we don't have like uh, real clients at the moment if we think that for example this the industry of of media or the industry of cinema might be interesting for us so we start working on project internal and we showcase this as an application for those who might be interested in, in, in these in the future. Uh, this is one. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it's, it's all about the word of mouth. So it took us like years to build this community and this network uh, around us. Uh, but now... I think 
40 to 50 percent of our work comes from word of mouth, either from previous clients or from alumni or graduates from our programs or members from the makers space themselves because you know people talk and people share ideas so if someone um, had like an enjoyable experience in the lab once and saw a client doing something related to photography for example when they meet the the, the next one they meet interested in photography they will tell them about how 3d printing can serve an application in photography and and, and so on so um, I hope I answered the question. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Omar. <clears throat> Thanks, Omar. And I, I think in some ways that echoes um, what Vicky was saying about um, the ways that these things come are not always linear. Um, the, they can come via various detours. And, um, and also um, what I know about some of the history of Kamasi Hive, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Maurice, but I, I know that some of the, um, uh, certainly some of the early consultancy projects there came through personal connections. Um, and I think that that's one important thing that um, hubs trying to do this can try to make some money from consultancy can do is, is really to get themselves out there um, and in whatever ways they can. Um, we are running up against the... Um, against time. Um, I, there's a question um, from Pamela that I would love to come to in, in just a moment, um, if you're able to stick around for that. But let's just um, very quickly um, summarize, um, I, I could do a couple of, of closing up topics. So I'm putting my email in the chat and please, if anyone would like to um, give feedback on this session, on this format, let me know what topics would be interesting for you to do in the future. What, um, how is your makerspace making money? What do you know about that you could be a future speaker on to share? Um, uh, if you could email me with any of those kind of things. Um, we will, when we fix the date for the second um, in the series, uh, we will share it that with the um, everybody who registered for this one. Um, if you haven't registered for this one and you would like to be emailed about that, please put your email in the chat. And now I'd like to just pass over to Fadia to do a brief introduction um, about GIG. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, everyone. This has been lovely. I think also it's just such an exciting way to start this year with the first community talk of GIG. Um, I just want to say that today is a really nice thing to see a lot of networks coming together. So today we're joined by gig members, but also our newly membership format, which is the hub membership. So a lot of our hubs are joining in. I'd like to thank them for being here because this is really part of what we're trying to develop is to see how could we facilitate this exchange between hub members around the world because we think that there is very little channels um, at the moment and very little um, platforms where these kind of topics are exchanged. We're always very happy to hear like this is how this started basically. It's just listening to our members and knowing about their concerns, what they have to offer and what they like to learn. So I really encourage everyone today that's here and would like to reach out with feedback as Anna said, but also with topics, with kind of um, uh, interests things they can offer or things they would like to hear about to get in touch with me. I'll, I'll put my email or Anna um, or anyone from the crew basically. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank everyone for this. Just also to say that today we're joined by the network from MAKE, from IOPA, uh, from our hub members, uh, hub members and our individual members. So this has been really amazing to just see everyone coming in, um, tagging along. Um, yeah, so just, kind of to say before I open the floor again or leave the floor for everyone to ask further questions um, is that uh, GIG is a network of these amazing people. We um, gather makerspaces, innovation hubs, people that are based in the global south but also from all around the world. Um, so if anyone is interested to know more please get in touch and yeah I think this is it. Thank you everyone. I can uh, hand it over to Anna. Thank you, Padia. Um, so we have hit the hour and I completely understand that many people may have other commitments and, and need to move on to other things. Um, we will make the um, recording available if you want to catch up um, 
or anything, but or equally, I'm available to stay for another uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and if other people would like to do that as well, to just continue the, the conversation a bit, then I'm very open to that. Um, and I, I just want to make sure everyone hears what Vicky just put in, in chat, which is use your positions, contacts and privileges or ways to support each other. I think that's a really important point. Um, and uh, in fact, um, I know that um, Maurice, you had some have some thoughts on how the AMN, um, the African Makerspace Network, is going to be able to support um, its members um, through consultancy. Would you like to just share those? Um, yeah, thank you, Anna. Um, so, yeah, uh, briefly, because of time again. Uh, so the African Makerspace Network um, is set up mainly to support the conversation around makerspaces on the continent. One of the things we're thinking about um, going forward, especially between this year and next year, is to identify opportunities, so liaise with development partners and identify opportunities in membership countries. So, for instance, if you're in Kenya, and you are part of the network, we identify a project in Kenya for Fab Labs or Makerspaces, then you as the hub in Kenya then leads the project to then have some level of income coming in your organization. So the network is then going to solicit or look for, as a network, look for some funding um, or some projects that are you know very relevant to your various ecosystems in your various countries, and then identify hub members or network members that are within the network to then be able to carry out these projects in their own countries so that they can also be strengthening their capacity and also what solutions they can equally give to their own country and their own community and their own ecosystem. So those are the things we're thinking about. I think it's a very good model to then again help make our spaces that are more or less like struggling to then have some level of relevance to then have their own conversation with development partners for their own ecosystems. So from there, we can then help them with business models that we are utilizing in Ghana and other places that are working for them to equally do the same. But the kickstart is more or less AMN helping you to then identify some of these opportunities to then run these projects in your own country. I mean, we can talk more about this when the time is given. So yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Maurice. Um, I There was a question um, in chat from, um, Pamela Crespo, um, I can't find it exactly now, but Pamela, perhaps if you could come off mute and ask, ask the question, it'd be great. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, um, I, I'm learning a lot. Uh, now uh, I am uh, building a public um, public uh, maker space, but a uh, public with, it's a private, uh, sorry, um, a, a public economic, um, I don't know, um, company. It's a public company that, uh, seeks to um, uh, pursue economic, but uh, also uh, ambiental and social development. So I, I want to know if you know, so uh, this kind of uh, maker space, how to do uh, it, its business model, because it, it has to be focused on people, but also it's a public company. So uh, I don't know if I, I, it, mm, I translate it well. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question, Pamela. Do we have anybody who feels qualified to, to comment on that? Um, hello? Yeah, I Maurice, think I'll, 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 I'll aim at saying something. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how well I got the question, but how I understood the question is how business models work um the fact that business that kind of business model is centered on people is that the actual question uh, the, the business i'm working on a business model of a maker space that is a public uh, maker space okay it's a uh, but is a uh, not a uh, only public it's a, a public company okay so it has it it focuses on people but it has to be real re re uh, renewed oh, so of course. Uh, yeah so it has to be sustainable, literally. So um, yeah. let me attempt at doing this. So one of the things you can build is build a community around it, right? So community members, these are companies that um, may utilize the maker space and may have to pay membership fees, right, to be able to use the, the maker space. They may not be able to be charged to utilize the place per se, 
but you can have them charge charge them a community membership fee, right? Depending on how large the community is, to so then make some level of generate some level of revenue to sustain maybe maintenance work and stuff like that because it's public, so it's free, right? But as a community, you can then create community programs where people may have to equally pay and attend. But one of the things that we've realized, even in, in, in the business incubation in Ghana, is that people don't pay for some of these services. So what we do is that you pay membership fees to then have access to premium services within those spaces. So of course, there are um, opportunities like Gig and Make that, I mean, you can work with. And for them to be able to join some of these projects, they have to be members of your space to then have opportunities for some international projects. So you have to tease them into wanting to do more with the space, right? You have to, for personally, I think that having them to pay, um, what do you call it, membership fees, it could, I mean, I don't know how the, the rates in your country is, it could be minimum wage, it could be something that might not cost them much, but maybe would want to help them to be committed to the space because it's a people's work you're doing. And it's an appeal to them as well, because then again, the place has to run regardless of um, uh, their money. And I think it's as they see relevance in the space, I'm not sure it'll be, it'll be a difficult thing for them to pay some membership fees. And once they see that the community is thriving, I'm pretty sure many more people would want to join it. So that's something I want to say in that regard. I don't know if the other speakers will add something to that. Yeah, actually, I, I would love to add to what uh, Moise said. Um, actually, you were just talking, you were just talking uh, me, Anna, and Jessica about the membership model. <laughs> Because it's it's uh, it's actually the 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 go to solution, but it's somehow tricky in some countries. And actually, we had like failure stories <laughs> about uh, in regards of, of of the memberships in in Egypt, because uh, people were were not aware of this concept and they didn't love it for, I think four to five years. So. I also have like another solution that worked it for us. I'm not sure if it, if it work in, in other contexts, which is the educational uh, or the funded educational programs. And actually this is a great way to build a community around the makerspace. And actually this is what we did. So we started with an educational program called Maker Diploma. Uh, and it was targeting like specific age group at the beginning. And then we, um, we um uh, we came we came we came up with other programs targeting other different ages uh, or target groups from this main program and uh to make sure that the educational program is accessible for everyone we tried approaching some sponsors like the cultural centers corporations like orange and so on and actually it 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 worked well because we uh, we managed to onboard at the beginning the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, and then we onboarded other sponsors. And actually, over the years, every year we have like sixty to one hundred and twenty alumni from this program. So you have community around the space. You have people that you so, uh, help them change their mindset and they started to bond with the space. So they are now ready and more ready for the membership model and more ready to, to be part of the community. And when we started reintroducing the membership model and uh, being a part of the makerspace and using the services with different packages and so on, people were more interested because we already had like a fan base that they know Im the importance of the makerspace now. Thank you both. And thank you too for the question, Pamela. Um, what other questions do we have? Is there anyone who'd like to, to raise something? I would like to know if it got better with like huh, so many maker spaces did not make money with the making. Is that getting better? Just like a show of hand, show of face. Is that getting better? <laughs> I, I, I'm a little bit out in the last month, so I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I, I was discussing this with, with Fadia last time we met offline because 
I, yeah, it's it's getting better in general, I think, worldwide. But the bad thing is some countries, the opportunities are not enough for everyone. So we have like big maker spaces that t- actually we had to deal with this ethical slash business slash whatever dilemma <laughs> because we figured out that when we were focused on solidating our revenue streams we we got surprised like after three or four years of focus we we were surprised that a lot of public maker spaces were shut down due to lack of funds and we felt bad somehow on the community level because we felt like it's one of our responsibilities as a community member to support each other and to figure out how to distribute this these opportunities. Um, so actually, this problem is what is arising at the moment that how can we cultivate more and more opportunities for people, especially that the international organizations and the corporations that are more and more interested in supporting innovation, they always look for solid portfolios and prior experience. So there's there is no chance for for you know for the the career starting maker spaces <laughs> all right hello everyone all right uh, my name is mustafa from noni hub mega space uh, located in the upper west region of ghana where precisely then with uh, regards to the previous question just which omar just Tackled. I would also like to add a little bit about it. I think uh, Megaspace is making money and how it's improving. I, actually, we've also had some challenges when it comes to making money out of the Megaspace. Because uh, more often, we, we realize that we spend so much in prototyping than we get from the product. So I think over the past few years, uh we changed our way of working and uh, we also entered into the educational aspect which also generated a couple i mean some amount of revenue for us so for instance we work with uh, basic schools uh, middle schools here we call them shs and uh, we introduce a maker community or the making idea to them and uh we've seen that a lot of them are showing interest in learning some of these skills ranging from electronics iot robotics and even general making woodworking tools and fabrication digital fabrication aspects. so we designed courses for them and uh, some of them were i mean some actually subscribe to the courses we designed for them in digital fabrication actually for 3D printing and other digital fabrication related courses. And uh, with the middle school, I think we had partnership with some of them that we teach, we found these STEM clubs in the schools where the, the schools pay us some fees uh, for subscription. Anytime we go there, we teach them how to basically make things out of the science they are learning how to apply practically and uh, we took some schools to a national competition i think uh, in 2021 we took a particular school to i think science tech fair and that was the first the only school that came from the northern region the upper west region and uh, they participated in the, uh, the competition so they showed interest in forming a partnership with us so we decided to expand our network to other schools too as well. So the year has just begun and uh, that's one way we, we are also looking to generate uh, income from the educational aspect. And also we have program for kids as well. Yes, so some of uh, the people here are now beginning to, uh, I mean, see 
the benefit of practical science. So we've created courses basically based on the educational curriculum that is provided by the educational services in the country. So we pick up the books and then we go through the science I think we might have lost your connection, Mustafa. Is this the same for others? Yeah. 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 So we can that's, move on, I think. That's, yeah, su such a shame. Um, um, yeah, I was really interested to hear what he was saying, but this, um, that is a shame. I have a um, quick comment on that because I like your question, Vicky, as always. Uh, is there people making money Fix. making? Oh, most and of we like find, that. get them into kits, and then we reach out to these, which uh, we charge them, so they come. Oh, yes. Oh, okay, can. Nope. All right. There was one last rise of the internet and then it gave up. Oh, oh, oh. Here's the app here. So uh, from what I see here, there are different. There's one maker space around making money with making itself. So they sell, for example, you were about to open a bar. And then you want a very personalized place to put your kidnaps and then you Hire them to create this kidnap portable thing for a new bar that is opening. And they are having this business model. There is this uh, other, other um, like Casa Criatura, because they do very professional stuff, you know? So they do not work with prototype all the time. They do houses, they do urban farms in shopping malls and at the same time, they have this maker space as part of a place to engage creativity in all the things they have in their space, you know? But most of the space I see as educational ones, part of them supported by government or whatever to teach STEAM things, you know? And part of them in a mixture of you can pay or government pay for someone, or just like Miguel does in La Via Vela, it sells kits for schools, or just like Mustafa said as well, I think, you know? You have the kids for a, a, a private school, it buys the kids, it's a kind of complementary school kit for fancy schools around. Not that fancy anymore, you know, because it's getting more popularized around here. Uh, and we'll, you'll have some public schools, public, 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 with robotic classes around because it become a must, you know? So <laughs> I think you'll have all this facets. I don't know if this is the name, but probably Greek word. So probably the English will be similar, but we'll have all these faces, you know, in mega space from what I see, this four or five different face on how to survive. I'm also like, because I, I agree 100% with what you said. It's now, now it has to be like that. Now every kid has to learn something about robotics, da, 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 da. What else do we need to, like we are a critical mass, right? So what else do we need to be, yeah, the kids need to learn this in 10 years from now. Like really, is it AI? Is it ethical AI? Is it like, what is it? Cause then, you know, it never stopped. You have to continue. <laughs> And also, I get bored so easily. So, um, what's our next big thing? And you don't have to answer. I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> it's just interesting. My my conversation this morning with my son around Minecraft and Microsoft, because you have to buy Minecraft hundreds of times in your life for a mobile, for a tablet, for a computer, and your children get old and you keep buying licenses for different same stuff. And Microsoft bought it, bought it from Java, the software, because it became the learning platform for Microsoft. You know, kids learn how to develop softwares for Microsoft using Minecraft since young childhood, you know, and they paid 30 millions for this. 
and that is, I don't have the answer, no. I just want to add to your question, this kind of stuff, big techs are doing this in a very decentralized way, and we pay for that. In the case of Minecraft, I had to pay four times though. Uh, and I said, I, I will never pay for Minecraft again, you know, take care of your Minecrafts. <laughs> Something like that. So they are already doing, you know, IBM does this pro bono for schools. And we as critical mass, we are struggling to sometimes print the other heads. Uh, just to bring again the other head to the table. <laughs> of course, my other, I don't have the other head, amazing. But just to point out, you know, just to add to your question. Something that I um, reflect on myself sometimes is I do think this issue of business models for maker spaces is really important, but I also sometimes think it shouldn't be so important that there should be other ways of funding the social value that is generated. Um, but until we figure that out, I think it's useful to have some focus on what the um, sustainability models can be. Um, I did just want to, to come back to Mustafa, um, if his connection is good at the moment, if there was just anything he wanted to say to finish up. Although I think we may have just lost him again. So I guess that's not a good connection. <laughs> um, any final thoughts, comments, um, anything from anybody before we close this up? Then I would just like to thank once again, the panelists um, who have kindly shared their expertise with us. And I also want to encourage everybody who's on the call to think about what it would be useful to discuss in future calls and what topics you know about that you could share with others. Um, and you can contact Fadia or myself um, with that. Um, my email is in the chat um, and yeah, just give us feedback so we know how to direct this series to make it as useful as possible. So thank you so much to everybody who has attended um, and, uh, and especially again to the panelists. Have a good afternoon or evening or night, everybody, whatever time of day it is. Bye-bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye. <laughs>